one of the last things that Harvard taught us was that your greatest achievement in life shouldn't be just going to Harvard. And here I am, seven years later, I'm still milking the Harvard brand name to give a talk, and not even a paid talk, right? So, but this is not the first time I'm milking the Harvard brand name. Actually, in 2016, this was, a Brad, this was a big Bloomberg article at that point in time. It was a hot topic. It was translated to a dozen of languages. It was a trending article at that point in time. And uh, the whole title was Two Harvard Students Changing uh, Landing in Southeast Asia. And that was when Reyna and I were still doing our, our, our master's at Harvard Business School. But, and at Harvard, what we realized is that class participation is very important. If you miss three classes, you fail the course, right? And if you don't speak up in class, you also get graded very badly. So the key strategy as students who really are not very hardworking is that my co-founder will, will put up his hand and say, hey, in Southeast Asia, this is so and so, this is how and how, because no one in the class can rebut us. There were only two Southeast Asian students there, myself and him. And, and I still vividly remember there was one strategy class, like it wasn't Harvard, um, uh, Michael Porter's class, but um, it was a competitive strategy class, and, he, and the lecturer was talking about, hey, what competitive advantage you have? And my co-founder, Raynaud, put up his hand again and said, what competitive advantage? My family business in Indonesia is in FMCG, is in construction, is in healthcare, that's totally not related. What competitive strategy? Money is a competitive strategy. Capital is a com competitive strategy in Southeast Asia. And little did we realize that these three words in Southeast Asia will make such a big difference in our whole startup life after that. So we have applied many principles that we learned at Harvard in, in our business, uh, business in the last seven, eight years. Of course, one of them was how do we build a distributed team, given that we started a company while we were still in school at, at, at Boston, right? And we managed it through internet and Skype and whatnot. So there were very, a lot of very good lessons, but what we also realized is that many of these lessons that is being uh, upheld at Silicon Valley in the US does not apply in Southeast Asia. Does not apply in Southeast Asia. And the first and foremost is that starting up in Southeast Asia is a really, really long game. Really, really long game. A lot of the articles, or even when Sequoia invested in us upon our graduation, told us that, hey, Kelvin, no pressure, but uh, usually it takes about seven years to become a unicorn. And some articles even show that it takes about five and a half years or so. But one thing I realized in Southeast Asia is that many of the real unicorns here actually takes much longer. Property Guru started in 2007. Garena started in 2009. Tokopedia started in 2009. And a lot of the, the gestation period in Southeast Asia for, for companies is actually a lot longer because how nascent the market is, how fragmented the market is. And the implication of that is it takes longer and more money for market education. It takes longer to clear regulations because it's nascent. And it takes longer for the willingness to pay to catch up. Uh, into the market for you to actually monetize well enough. So the gestation period is actually meaningfully longer. But at the same time, you also realize that instead of blindly, and if you go with the US way of just blindly following the conventional wisdom that let's do one thing and be 10 times better, you realize that uh, you'll be a really good but small company because it's very hard for you to penetrate and the, at the channels fast enough. And you'll notice in Southeast Asia, a lot of the startups at an earlier stage in 2015, 18 or so, many of them are clones. I'm the Uber of Asia, I'm the Netflix of Asia, I'm the so-and-so or Groupon of Asia, right? And that, while it, it makes, while a lot of these companies grow very quickly, it did not sustain very, very well. And that what you realize is that a lot of the companies end up having to expand the breadth of their business as well as regional scale of the business to hit meaningful scale and monetization. And that makes starting up in Southeast Asia that just that much harder. So if you're a founder and you've started for many years and you realize that, hey, I'm still not a unicorn, like don't fret, because the statistics in the US in markets that are more homogeneous, like China, like US, and like Europe, not sure about India. India is quite, quite heterogeneous as well. Like the statistics there just do not apply in Southeast Asia as much. In fact, if you look at crunch base, based on all the listed companies in Southeast Asia, the average founding year is 1987. It's 1987, which also shows that if you cross the chasm of becoming a, a meaningful scale business, you are going to be likely to be here to stay because your competitors will have to go through the same pain. Uh, it will not be five, five and a half to seven years for them to catch up. It will be much, much longer. So hang on there, cross it, and you'll be good. So the question is that how long does it take? How long is a long game? How long does it take for you to cross? And there are a few data points that's good for reference, right? If you look at it from an individual perspective, Malcolm Gladwell's outlier talks about 10 years. And the most recent uh, 
talk that Graham Weaver gave from Alpine at the last lecture at Stanford. He also referenced to the whole timing of 10 years. And finally, there's a whole Chinese saying or Mandarin saying, 十年磨一天, right? 10 years to just sharpen one blade. 10 years to just sharpen one blade. Obviously, this ties in is more related to individual research rather than organization, but I do think that there's certain parallels or reference point for it. However, I see that once they, they achieve this tipping point, you see that they become iconic business that uh, in across Southeast Asia, right? And I was particularly inspired by one of the investor meeting that I had. So that was with one of a very prolific investor. And after one hour of conversation, that was in 20, 2019, I still remember today. He asked me, Calvin, why is the biggest bank in Southeast Asia? At that time, I only started out for three, four years. How do I, how do I even care about that? So at that time, it's DBS Bank. It was worth $50 billion. The next question is, how big is the SME franchise? My guess, maybe $10, $15 billion. And a punchline question, how long do you think it will take you to get there? You see that investors who actually know businesses they actually take, start taking a really long-term view, and I generally encourage at least founders in Southeast Asia that that should be the view you take, right, in terms of what will be the final destination, not just in the five, seven years for Unicorn, but what is possible, because once you cross the tipping point, I genuinely think that you'll be the iconic business in Southeast Asia. So how do one play the long game, right, given that it's so painful and all the founders have been talking about how, how much resilient and pains they have been, right? So the, the Xiaomi's founder, Lei Jun, said in Chinese, right, in, in English, it basically means that starting up is not for humans, it's for animals. Because it's just so inhumane, so painful for any human beings to do that, right? So the only way we see that we can do it and survive during that period of time is, as a, is to do it as a tribe. So for years, we had followed what we were taught, right? And usually in, in most of the, the articles, you will say that, hey, hire the best, hire the, the Ivy Leaks, hire the, the starry resumes, right? But what you realize is that oftentimes, if you follow the resume for starry names, it's a very bad shit and miss. Because unlike in the US or even in China, right, you can have one star genius who can change the whole company, be it in terms of Steve Wozniak at Apple or like uh, Alan, uh, Alan Chang at WeChat, right? One person can make a pretty sizable change in Southeast Asia. But look at Southeast Asia, which CTO can truly make that difference and carry the whole company? Given that there are so many different regulations, languages, customer segments, so and so forth, it's almost not possible. You almost certainly need a tribe. And based on ChatGPT, a tribe is a group of people who shares the common values and interests. You'll notice that there's no mention of caliber here. Not people who share the same caliber, but common values and interests, right? And to me, the common values here refers to the core values of company. So when Sequoia invested in us during our graduation, they mentioned that they gave us two advice. The first was not to grow too fast. The second was codify your core values. And that is also what has helped us to, to really survive to now, right? One of the core values was grow relentlessly. And our very first hire in 2015, who is still with us, Kennedy did not come with a Silicon Valley resume. He was leading almost all functions except for credit and operations. But, and then we, as we became more specialized, he cut down in terms of scope. So hey, having to take a humble pie to actually take, do lesser things. But over time, he grows up. And now he's, he's one of the key persons leading our Thailand business as well as debt raising, a highly significant person, despite not having a Silicon Valley resume, because of the core values of growing relentlessly. And I think this core values is also why we see that we have team members who boomerangs, like leave the company and rejoin us back when the stars align. That I, as a founder, am added into an ex-funding society's uh, WhatsApp group. And it's actually pretty active. People keep in touch, follow up, help each other for, for quite a bit, right? But of course, we realize that a tribe is not all rainbows and sunshine, right? The fact that by definition, a tribe means that some people are in the tribe and some people are outside of the tribe. You don't belong to us, right? And as a result of that, you're gonna be, you're gonna annoy people and you're gonna be attacked or even be twisted in public, right? And that, despite our best effort in terms of appeasing, unfortunately, you don't always get it right, especially in my timing now with six seconds, I'll try to finish it. So one thing we, we realized that the tribe is what helps us to weather through the last eight years, right, of founding. You'll notice that in the last eight years, we had three years of regulatory uncertainty when there was no license. We had to create that by working with regulators. We have three years of COVID-19, which is the worst pandemic since 1918, the Spanish flu, a century bad pandemic. And we have another interest rate hike that's highest in 22 years, right? So out of our eight years of, of existence, we were fighting wars of, for seven years, right? And this is only possible thanks to the tribe that we have been, been around, right? And I do think that after all, starting up a business is really doing interesting, meaningful things with interesting business, uh, with interesting people, right? He you should have right? So, and we, as we, taken the opposite view 
And when we start finding societies, and we learned we were drinking a Kool-Aid of Harvard Business School, right? That how do we educate leaders who change, make a difference in this world, right? I think one thing we realize is that it is not the principle, the lessons, or the positions that Harvard taught us about that has been very valuable for us. But it's really how can we make independent thinking based on the context of Southeast Asia? Because a lot of things that work in overseas really does not work in Southeast Asia, right? And that when you do that, a lot of investors are going to question you. A lot of, a lot of Writers are going to diss you or even critique you, right? And that one thing I would like to strongly encourage all the fellow founders and the founders pick here is the whole quote from Theodore Roosevelt, who is also a Harvard alumnus. It is not a critic who counts, not a man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man in the arena who is actually at the worst. If he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly. So that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who never know victory nor defeat. I'm Calvin from Finding Societies, and I exist to grow to find the growth of societies in Southeast Asia. Thank you.